Coming to you from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, by way of Stone Mountain, Georgia, birthed by the great state of South Carolina, is the Bryant Land Country Podcast, your place for any and everything in hunting, fishing, sports, and outdoor related, with heavy doses of randomness, guests, and an all-around good time. Here's your host, proud Gamecock, South Carolina Forever, AB3. All right, now everybody, welcome to another episode of the Bryant Land Country Podcast. I am your host, AB3, and I'm covered in pollen. Oh my goodness, man, I was home for a few days down in Georgia, got out into the woods, you know, had a good time, you know, doing some property work, did a little bit of turkey hunting, wasn't successful in my turkey hunting, but man, just being outside, covered in pollen it's that time of the year it's april it's springtime pollen raining down man the evil yellow dust i had to make sure i had my allergy medicine yes had to take allergy medicine because otherwise i'm out there sneezing coughing and hawking up all kind of mucus and all kind of crap man so if you're out there in the woods man just make sure you got whatever you need if you got bad allergies don't try to be superman you know going out there make sure you're taking your, your allergy medicine and stuff man because that pollen can ruin your hunt you know what i'm saying you don't want to have that big gobbler come through and you out there sneezing because you want to be macho man or whatever and not take you know the precautions and not take the stuff that you need you know to help you get through the day anyway my guest this week we have our very first couple on the podcast the marshes antonio and kimberly marsh will carry the honor of being the first couple on the bryant land country podcast you know they've been married for a very long time they hunt together they fish together you know they do things together as a family i was very happy to get to talk to antonio and kimberly you know wonderful people uh mutual friend of ours bought us together you know a fellow that i worked with down in uh south carolina did baseball games together used to do basketball games together and he was actually the first person to help me shoot some of my videos. Uh, my good buddy, Xavier Blake, uh, shout out to the X-Man down there in Columbia. And he put, you know, Antonio and me together in touch. He said, hey, three, this is somebody that you probably want to talk to. Next thing you know, we're on the phone, Antonio and I, we're talking. We had a great conversation. He did the podcast. His wife came on, did the podcast with me. So we had a great time. You know, we definitely made a new uh, set of hunting buddies through you know this podcast so I'm going to back up out the way let you guys listen to my conversation with Antonio and Kimberly Marsh from the great state of South Carolina Columbia Midlands area of South Carolina Antonio and Kimberly Marsh Antonio Marsh thanks for joining me man how you doing doing all right how you doing man I can't complain can't complain just glad to get uh chance to sit down and i appreciate when we have like a mutual a mutual friend that kind of you know links me up with other people and uh for interesting people to talk to so i'm looking forward to this yeah man i think even he was surprised when he found out you know we were hunting he looked at me like what so yeah (laughs) we're trying to do a little something out here (laughs) it's fun because i've known x for a few years and you know he would run camera for me whenever i would do uh games over at carolina and the first Mm -hmm. time i went out to go on a hunt a hog hunt down um god i forgot the town but it's down in the low country it's on the other side uh um uh, orangeburg and stuff like that it'll come back to me uh later but anyway when i went down there and i wanted to try to film he was the person that i pegged to come with me and film and he was like yeah i'll do it he's like i've never you know filmed any hunts before or really uh hunted anything like he had nothing and he was all excited like he was all about it he was just like where can i go to get camos like what kind of camo should i get and i sent him like youtube links and stuff you know just to get a feel for it man he, he's always just been a good dude and like i said when i started you know putting uh the filming and stuff together he was the person that i had uh that i had pegged so yeah he's a great dude man yeah, he's a good guy, man. Just met him recently, maybe last year. And he, he immediately, when he found out, he said, hey, I got somebody I need to get you in contact with. And I think the same night, I think, is when we touched base through uh, through Instagram that night. 
Yeah, yep, yep. Because he he same enthusiasm. He was like, I think I got somebody that you might be uh, interested in for your podcast. I was like, shit, come on, send it on. Because shoot, that's awesome, man. Like I said, I'm glad we uh we got a chance to do this. So I'm gonna start from the top. Hunting with the marshes. Who are the marshes? The marshes are are some people who have no clue what we're out here doing. It. <laughs> we, we we are winging it. I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you. I got into hunting through actually my my wife's supervisor, countryest redneck guy you ever meet, man. I'm not gonna joke you. This, this guy goes into Buffalo Wild Wing and a karaoke prince, and it's the funniest thing you'll ever see. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm he serious. does a wait a minute. He does a carry uh does karaoke prince. It's a country regnant version of Prince Purple Rain. Wow. <laughs> okay. Thing you ever see. And he doesn't care who's laughing at him or who's joking, but by the time he's midway through the song, everybody's got their phones up waving them like they're liars. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And what happened one day, I told him um, I had got a bow, and I, I was doing the bow just for sport, you know, no intentions of hunting. You know, I grew up in a military family, so. I, I had no clue about hunting, what hunting was. And he said, uh, hey, why don't you come out with me one day? And I was like, look, man, I have nothing. He's like, look, all you got to do is you know, get some clothes, you know, some cover scent, you know, get your hat, you know, make sure you get your license and all that, all that good stuff. I said, okay, no problem. Well, needs to say, the first time we go out, we actually went on Fort Jackson down here where we work at. And, you know, we go out there, and I'm thinking he's going to sit with me. We go into, deep into the woods. He gets me in an area. Um, I bought a ground blind. He got me set up. He said, all right, man, you know, I'll be back in about four hours or so. I was like, you just going to leave me? And he was like, yeah. He said, you'll be okay. So I was sitting there, first time on a hunt, man, 5 o'clock in the morning. It's pitch black. That's like the first time in my life I ever wished the sun would hurry up and come up. Because <laughs> <What? laughs> when it's dark, you hear all kind of stuff, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's true. <laughs> So I got into it, you know, and of course I started to get into it. Then, you know, my daughter said, hey, I'm interested. And then my wife said, well, I'm interested. So, of course, that went, you know, to getting them camo and, you know, getting them out there in the woods and get, getting climatized and accustomed just to the hunting environment. And um, that's kind of where it took off. You know, our, our first year, I tell you, it, it, it was a lot of trial and error, a lot of error, just to be honest with you. Like I said, we didn't know what we were doing. So as I started to start paying attention, I was going to like some of the big name brand stores. I start talking to guys and, and listening and start being perceptive as to what was going on. And the first year was literally like sitting in the woods doing nothing, hearing squirrels coming by saying, hey, I think it's a deer or waiting for the sun to come up and looking at branches overhanging, thinking it's a deer and it's not a deer, it's a branch. You know, your mind plays tricks on you when you get out there that time. Right. And, it was it was it was a lot of a lot of frustration, man. Once I got out of that that first year, and and, and and some of it, you know, as I keep investing more and more into this, it was almost like that point of kind of like agony. You know, when am I going to start producing? Right. It's like you get that that top five draft pick, but he's scoring, you know, four points a game. <laughs> right. But it doesn't take long to get to a point of no return, though. Oh yeah, and it got there quickly. And I think what really what really helped me. Just talking and met a young lady on Fort Jackson and come to find out her father um, has a hunt club out here in Lugolf, South Carolina, Miller Swamp Club. So I met him, talked to him on the phone a couple of times, and, you know, he bought me out and says, hey, you know, this is what we got. You know, they, they got a hunt club out there, 3,000 acres, man. And he said, we got it all. We got deer, we got hogs, we got turkeys, we got guys who duck hunt in the back, you name it. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I went out a couple of times, my daughter and I, he let us you know, guest visit, come out and see it, see if it's something we're interested in. But like I told him, I said, here's the deal, man. You know, we got to we gotta pass this through the boss first. And he said, the wife, he said, yes. Trust me, <laughs> every member out here has to go through their wife before he joined this club. <laughs> so he actually said, well, he says, uh, well, bring your wife out. And so we got out there and we rode around on Polaris and he showed us some things and showed a couple of stands and the feeders. And she was like, hey, if it's something you want to do, you know, go ahead and do it. You know, jump into it. Right. And, um, Got into it, and first year there, it's kind of like meeting the guys and, you know, just trying to learn the lingo and, you know, how does it, how do you do this and how do you do that? And I'll be honest with you, man. I'm, I'm one of those guys, I was not a consistent hunter, you know, when we first started. 
I was like, yeah, I may hunt this morning. Uh, I may go tomorrow. Mm-hmm. But I realized you can't be, be productive if you're not out there. Right. You can't be in the bed expecting, oh, I took down an eight point when you're rolling over fluffing your pillow. Right. It's like it's like the old the old adage, uh, old adage, you can't kill them from the couch. And, and that is so true because that, that was the thing with me, you know, when I first started too, it was like, okay, I'll go like for a day or, you know, go for like a few hours or whatever. And then you might see something, but you really, you know, you really not giving yourself good odds to be successful you got to put in that time and then finally this year like on my own property down in georgia you know i put together like okay i'm gonna go for like three days two or three days straight or whatever you know hunt you know morning and night and whatnot and finally it paid off so but yeah Yeah. that's you you gotta give you gotta get out there and give yourself the um the opportunities to be successful and you know what man what you just said was exactly what turned for us uh, because the first stand I set up, I went out there, actually, I, I painted it, you know, get the burlap straight. Then I got into buying feeders and cameras and doing food plots or so make sure I'm running the feeder at a certain time. I just followed the process, man. And right. It is a funny story. The first time I ever got anything, I had no intentions of going that morning. I just didn't feel like it. Mm-hmm. But my wife was like, hey, you might as well go. You got nothing else to do tomorrow. I was like, nah, okay, I'll see how I go. <laughs> so, <laughs> I go in, and as I keep doing this, I keep making mistake after mistake, but I'm not realizing this. Like, one of the things I did, I had a bad habit of instead of parking out on the road, I would drive my car all the way in, past my stand, park it, and walk 30 yards back to my stand. <laughs> not thinking that, like, guy, you probably scared everything away. Right. As you're driving in. Did you slam your well, did you slam the truck and stuff to slam the door and everything too after you got out? Oh yeah. Uh set the horn, set the alarm, everything. <laughs> Walk right to my stand. No oh noise, just say anything. You know? And of course I get in the stand and like most hunters do, and if a hunter says he doesn't do it, he's lying, get right on my phone. Right. So I'm on the phone, I sit there, I hear my feeder go off, I'm like, Okay, it's a good morning. Feeder just went off. So as I'm sitting there, you know, looking at high school football score. I think that's, that's what I was doing that morning. Probably about, <laughs> about 6.05, 6.10. I just happened to just stop, and I glanced to the left, and I just saw, like, this movement go by the stand. I'm like, what is that? Right. So now I'm, I'm sitting there, I'm listening, and I just start hearing this grunting. I'm like, those are hogs. So now the, the agony is setting in because it's still dark. I have no shooting light. So I'm like, are these hogs going to stay till I get shooting light? You know, I'm waiting almost another 25 minutes. And believe it or not, these hogs stayed in place eating that whole time. The crazy thing about it, when I get light, I look through the scope, I'm like, this is it. This is the moment I've been, I've been working, I've been waiting on. Mm-hmm. Headshot is what I train myself for. What do I do? I aim center mass on this hog. <laughs> well, like, what with you a doing? rifle? Or, you had a rifle or a bow? With a rifle. Okay. And luckily, I think I must, I must have aimed too high, and I think I must have hit a spine shot, and it dropped to where it was at. Wow. So as I'm sitting here, I'm looking, I'm like, it's not moving. So, of course, I'll, I'll start thinking about what I learned in you know, the South Carolina Hunters Education course. Yep. You know, take your time, walk up from the rear, you know, make yourself prepared. What do I do? I come, I walk right towards the front of this hall. If this hall pops up, and, of course, I have a 22, so I end up, putting it down but i was like you just told yourself this is what you do but the, the problem is in that whole moment of anticipation right finally getting something lost all train of thought and luckily you know the hunting gods were with me that day and after you figured two years of agony i'll finally leave out of there with something to show right and i kid you not i was like a kid it was almost like the burden of stress and relief which just lifted off my shoulders oh yeah oh yeah so, Definitely. I was, I was able, you know, to take that picture and send it to my wife. She was excited. My daughter was like, she was like ecstatic, man, because she was just like, Dad, it's like just all the work we put in has finally paid off. Right. It's funny because, you know, you go through all those steps, and like you said, you know, you go through the manual and all that stuff, but when the rubber meets the road, man, that, all that book learning goes out of the window. Like, when, yeah. you know, it, it's good, and you try to, you know, 
it, it's a good start, but there's nothing like field time and 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 making you know your mistakes and and learning from them in the process. I mean, I had the same thing happen to me uh, this year on my property. Like, you know, I've been, I set up a blind and everything. I got my feeder pattern and everything down. I go, I walk in and I hear uh, these deer, you know, I'm going to my blind. I hear them and then they start blowing back at me. So I immediately stop and then they blow a little bit more. And then they took off. I was like, all right. So I go, I sit down. I didn't even worry about setting up the camera or anything. I just got in the blind, sat down quiet. And I'm thinking like, ah, oh, all right, I've screwed this up for the morning. Like, you know, whatever. About mm, 9.30, 10 o'clock, you know, kind of like you sitting there thumbing on Instagram. <laughs> I mean, like you said, if, if, if you say you don't do it at some point, you're lying. I'm sorry. You know, I see people all the time. Right? Just, Damn, off the phone, leave the phone at home. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, I get it. But if you, I mean, obviously you don't have to be on it the whole time, but if you say you don't reach out and pull it, check a score or, you know, check something, especially when business is slow, then like I said, I, I think you're lying. But anyway, so I went, you know, I checked my phone and all of a sudden five does come trotting, circling, wrap back around. I'm like, okay, because I'm thinking like I'm about to wrap this up, you know, maybe in a little while. Like, okay, we'll try again later this afternoon or something. Sure enough, they come around, they circle around. I kind of sit there, I catch, you know, start, you know, breathing, make sure, you know, you calm down or whatever, you breathing normal, whatnot. And then I sit there and I watch them for a little bit and I wait for a shot and I draw my bow back. And then, you know, I take them out or take her out. And then once, you know, you make that shot and, you know, the Mm -hmm. animal's down. And like you say, you taking those pictures and stuff, man, it's just like, okay, finally, finally, you know, we we put everything together and we've done something right, man. It's it's a great feeling. It's a great feeling. And even with my daughter, the second second animal we ever harvested, my daughter did it. And it was it was a late night shot. But we were still within, not late, late evening shot, we were still in shooting light. And the guy who managed our club, you know, Mr. Miller, the one thing he told me, he says, when you start looking around, don't invest a lot of money in your rifle. You need to invest your money into your scope. Your scope is going to be critical, he says, because when you're out there, he says, honestly, when do you see the most movement? I was like, right before it gets dark. He said, exactly. Get yourself a good scope, collect more light. And I learned that with my daughter because um, the hog came out. She said, Dad, I can see a hog. And I'm like, I don't really don't see anything. She's like, well, I can see it. I said, well, if you got a good shot, take it. So she hit it, and she got a good shot on him. The hog went right into the bushes. So now I'm out there looking, and I'm like, okay, this is my daughter. First one she's getting. So now it's like, I don't want to fail her because I know how anxious I was to get my first. And the disappointment, you know, if I was going to let it get away, and right. the first mistake I learned, critical mistake I learned in hunting is I didn't take my time and look. And I looked, I looked, I couldn't find it. So I said, I called Mr. Miller. He came out and he went about maybe 15, 20 yards in. He was like, I found it. It's right here. And I'm just like, how did I just not see it? How did I overlook that? But even the excitement she had when she found it, it was just crazy for me to be there. And for her to get the pictures, show to her friends, and even for her, you know, and I hate to say it, being a young African-American female, when she shows those pictures, people look at her like, you shot that? Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, and that, that is always like, uh, it doesn't happen as much anymore. But, yeah, when I first started, that, that's always the kicker. It's just like, oh, you hunt? And then you show like, some of the pictures, like, whoa. It's just like, you, yeah, 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 yeah that, that's me. I, I, I did it. Yeah. <laughs> that, that initial reaction is always funny. Let me, let's backtrack real quick. So it's you, your wife, and your daughter, right? Right. And I have a son, and too. How, how old is you? I'm sorry. Go I ahead. I'm sorry. Too, but it's like pulling oh. teeth trying to get this guy out there. <laughs> what? Is he Is he one of those uh, Fortnite kids? I don't I don't know. what He, he, he wasn't a kid. Even when he was a kid growing up, he didn't, like, get dirt on him or nothing. Okay. So he was okay. like, yeah, I'm going to come out. I'm like, dude, you're telling us we're going on three years now. You still haven't come out. How old is he and how old, how old is your daughter? He's 27 and my daughter is 22. Okay. Okay. That's still that's that's a a great age to get to get started at. And you said you all you all started about three years ago. About, yeah, about three years ago. 
Okay. And I mean, um, I started out in Camden. There's a lady there, a good friend of mine. His mom has like 34 acres there. And she would allow me to go out there and hunt, which, like I said, I wasn't following the rules and, you know, watching the wind and doing what I'm supposed to be doing. But I'm going to say that year right there was probably the best thing that could have happened because I was on 34 acres. There was nobody else there. I could make my mistakes, just kind of get myself acclimated to being outdoors. Um, I could take my daughter, take her out with me, put her on one of the land. I go to the other side of the land, you know, and just try to figure out, hey, this is how you do this. And then – it was almost like when we went to the hunt club, it was almost like being pulled from, you know, the minor leagues up to the big leagues. Right. And it's like, okay, we went from 34 to 3,000 acres. It was like, we're not in the little gym anymore. You know, we're up here, you know, in the Lakers at the old you know, playing <laughs> ball. But see, that's good because that, you know, starting off like that, like you said, it prepared you for going into into the hunt club. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate that I have my own land in Georgia to hunt, you mm-hmm. know, 30 33 and a half acres that it's just me and my son out there and that's pretty much how i kind of keep it you know we kind of do our own thing i go out there like you said you learn and you make your mistakes but then with me traveling as much as i do i do like a lot of uh outfitted hunts like if i can carve out the time i'll go with an outfitter and stuff and just the learning you know, it's almost like going to somebody else's house. You know, you go to somebody else's house, you mm-hmm. got to follow their rules. You know, you can do your stuff on your land, but then when you go somewhere else, you know, you kind of got to fall in line. And some of the stuff that you can do at your place, you may not be able to do there. Also, some of the tactics that may work at your place may not work at this other place. It, I mean, it right. just depends. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny you say that because I, I believe in, you know, there's a process what you do. But I also believe that hunting is, is partially about being in the right place at the right time and a little bit of luck. And I saw that with my wife because we went out one morning, and that whole morning was just a disaster from the start. We got out there, got in the stand. Of course, I drove in again. We got in the stand. We're ready. I had hogs coming in left and right throughout the week. So, of course, we get out there, and the feeder doesn't go off. So now I'm like, what is going on? So what do I do? I get out of the stand, walk to the feeder, and try to find out what's going on. Where I'm thinking, as I thought about it, I said, well, if the hogs were coming in consistent, you shouldn't have to worry about the feeder. So I went out there anyway, checked it, feeder, spinner's not stuck. So I reached my hand in there. I'm throwing corn in the air. I'm like, okay, well, whatever. So I'm walking back. I get right to the stand. I go to uh, climb up, and she's looking down at me, and she, her eyes, you know, like those emoji eyes that get real big. Right. And she's, like, pointing behind me. She was like, Pointing like, you know, behind me. And I'm like, what? So I stopped, and all of a sudden, you could just hear all this movement behind the stand. What was it? It was the hogs. <laughs> so <laughs> if I would have been patient, all of my process, knowing they were coming out like clockwork, right. you shouldn't have to worry about it. So, of course, I get in the stand, so now I'm mad. I'm furious because I was like, this is her chance to get something. Okay, whatever. Eventually, some smaller hogs came out, and, you know, she's shooting a Ruger, a 7-millimeter weight. I was like, well, look. You hit one of those small ones with that, you're probably not going to have too much meat. I'm just telling you. <laughs> so she's like, well, I'm not going to shoot it. So we went the whole weekend and just nothing. So now I'm mad because I screwed up everything, got out the stand. I say, well, look, it was Sunday afternoon. I say, well, let's just go back out, see if the hogs come out, see if, you know, if you can get something. We'll sit about three hours, and if not, just come home. So we get out there, we sit, nothing. I'm like, okay. I was like, are you ready to go? She's like, yeah. So we're in the middle of packing up. And all of a sudden, she reaches over and taps me and points outside the stand. This eight-point buck is like 15 yards in front of the stand. Oh, wow. Literally just creeping through. He was so close, she said, I can't see him in the scope. That's how close he was. So I said, well, get the time. And what he was doing, he was chasing a doe because his head was down. Yep. And he could care less what was going on around him. So he walked in. He walked past, went in the woods. I was like, I think he'll come back out. Sure enough, maybe 60, 70 yards, he came back out, went straight to the feeder. And when I tell you, he gave a textbook pose to say, shoot me. (laughs) And I looked at her, and I was like, what are you waiting on? So she shot, bam, hit him. He ran in the woods. Of course, it took us forever all night to finally Mm -hmm. track him. But you're talking somebody, the first time they ever went out, Honey, she's an eight-point buck, 185 pounds, first time wow. I Wow. 
Man. And I'm just saying, looking like I've been going on forever trying to find something. You come out here the first time. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I do believe there is a lot of beginner's luck too and then it kind of tapers off because every piece of hunting that I've done you know early on whether it was deer whether it was ducks and goose turkeys not so much hogs like the first time I went out I ended up getting something and I, I, I really do believe in beginner's luck and then it, you know it gets y'all amped up and you're excited and you're like all right it's gonna be like this every time and then once you start getting into it you, yeah. you get humbled a whole lot more than you do than you get to brag. I, I know that much. Oh yeah, and one thing I did, I, I was trying to follow, you know, the, you know, like let's say the five stages of hunting, hunter development, you know, be an ethical hunter, and I let a lot of deer walk that first year because I was kind of like, okay, do I shoot this one? Do I not shoot that one? You know, and as I learned, because I didn't, I didn't want to be one of those. You know, they say, you know, you got that shooting stage, which we all go through it. You just want right. to shoot something. You got the guys who had, you know, that limit out. I'm trying to fill all my tags. And then we, as we get older, you know, which is kind of where I am now, you start looking at, you know, the trophy stage, you know, then, then your method, and, of course, the sportsman. And it's like, you know, as I start really thinking about what I learned in the course and listening to a lot of the older hunters, I understand right. what they're saying. And you figure it took me three years to get – you know, my first deer. Now, when you when you were passing these deer and stuff, do you guys have like a a, a restriction uh, out at the club? How does how does that work? Yeah, we do. Normally, they want us at least eight, you know, eight point or four on one side, three on the other one. Fifteen inch spread. They will allow you like like a like a thirteen and a half on one. But you know, as a new guy, and I'm out here trying to figure this out, and I'm looking through a scope. I'm like, what? Well, how right. do I figure this out? I don't know what this. 15 inches or 13 inches you know should i shoot it should i not shoot it you know so you let a few walk and then you get a few that come out and i had two i actually took a shot but one was about 150 yards the other one may have been 120 and so now i'm kind of i'm questioning myself do i take this shot because i don't want to miss this deer and i have a, a wounded deer running around the woods you know is all that came into play it's like i'd rather let this one pass yep. and not say well i shoot this deer also now this deer is walking around for a couple of days perp because i just made a bad right call. and it ended up being coyote food or something like that exactly now you were saying you know how you're doing like on the club and and whatnot now do you have so is it divided up like in you have like your own little spot in the club that you are responsible for maintaining? Because I heard you say, you know, you do like food plots, you put your own stands out, you got your feeders out. Like, do you have like a certain amount of acres or like a little corner or a little area that's specifically designated to you that you have to take care of? Yes. Well, what we do, um, we're required to do three work days per year. And that usually will start around April time frame. So I have I actually have two two areas. I have one. Um, my primary stand, which I rifle hunt from, and I also have a blind, which I do my bow hunting. So the cool thing about it, like I said, we have 3,000 acres, but it's only 25 members. So you really have nobody around you. And I think they do that for safety reasons. And we have to be at least, I think it's eight, either eight or nine feet up when we're rifle hunting. There's no ground hunting. Unless you're turkey hunting, shotgun, there's no rifle hunting from the ground of a blind, which it works out because the good thing for me, I hunt near the front of the club because I don't, you know, I don't have a truck yet, which I'm getting there. I don't have four-wheel drive, so I can't get way to the back like some of the other members can. So a lot of those guys, they go way to the back because, you know, they say, hey, there's a lot of bigger bucks right. back there. There's more hogs. But the guy who manages the club, he says, Antonio, he says, I'm going to tell you, the front of that club where you are, he said, there are a ton of bucks running there because everybody's in the back. He says, I'm telling you. So as I started seeing trail cam pictures, I was like, he's right. You know, I heard a lot of guys where, you know, the bucks, you know, they'll never come to the feeder. And, and I say, well, I, I beg to differ because I can show you October, November time frame where I had three good size bucks around let me, the feeder. Let me tell you now. This, you know, this so, is the thing that kill that kills me when people say that. And it, and, it, and it, I'm kind of in the same boat with you where you're learning like trial and error because yeah you know it's like oh you'll never kill a buck over corn you the bucks will never come to to a feeder uh yeah okay they might come more so at night correct 
But once mm-hmm. November hits, all bets are off. And if there are a lot of does hanging around those feeders, they are going to come because they are going to check those feeders looking for those does. Mm-hmm. So that's one of those things that I'm starting to believe is an old wives tale. I mean, yeah, they come a, they come a lot at night, but once late October and November hits and if you got does constantly hitting your feeders, what I've found is those bucks once late October, November hits, they will be there at one o'clock in the afternoon, 3.30 in the afternoon, seven o'clock in the morning. They will be there at shooting light. The trick is, is you just got to be there. Yeah, and the first deer I killed, that one I got in November, that's exactly what happened to me. Um, I went out that morning, and it was cold. For South Carolina, it was cold. And I sat there, and I said, you know what? And I literally had just sent my wife a message, and I said, you know what? I was like, F this. I'm out of here. It is freezing. <laughs> and I sat maybe, <laughs> I kid you not, I sat maybe another 10 minutes. Right I was going to get my stuff together, I just saw this movement to my left, and I looked up, and it was a buck. He was just slowly creeping in, coming right towards the feeder. So now, this is, I've been practicing with the bow at the range every day, going through technique, fundamentals, trigger release, uh, grip. And I'm going to tell you, like we said earlier, all that went out the window, man. That buck walked up. You know, I put my release on, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just trying to wait. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for a good shot. This deer walked in and came all the way to the feeder and stopped and started eating. Mm -hmm. And the bad luck for me that day, right as I went to draw back, he looked up, he saw me, and he took off. So the guy who managed that club, he had been stressing to me, get yourself a bleak call. So right as that that buck ran, I hit the bleak call, and he literally stopped in his track. (laughs) And he turned around, and I could see him maybe 30, 40 yards in the bushes. I knew he was there, and he knew something was over here. Mm Mm-hmm. So I watched him. I hit that bleed again, and he came right back to the feeder where he was at. Oh, wow. I said, I don't believe that just worked. So this time, I had myself prepared. I still had the nerves. I was shaking. So I drew back, and right as I drew, he turned and he looked up. And so now I see a lot of guys who, who say, hey, practice holding your draw because you don't know how long you might have to hold that draw. Right. And we went for a minute, and I actually I had to let had to let him let it back down because I just I started shaking so bad. So once I got my composure, I went, I pulled back again, and he went to eat, and he came and put his head up. He went perfect broadside. I let it go, and the arrow complete pass through went right through him. Yeah, and I was just like, okay, did all this just happen? <laughs> so I put my head at the blind. Yeah, and I, I see him take off, and I hear him running. I hear him running, and it's like I I could have swore I heard him fall. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get about 30, 45 minutes before I go start looking. And I was so anxious, I, I was more on the side of 30. So I went, I looked for blood, couldn't find any blood, man. Look, look, looking. I go out, I look almost an hour and a half. I could not find this deer for nothing. This is a true story. I called one of the guys in the club. I said, hey, we got anybody here with dogs who can track deer? He was like, well, yeah, you know, call, you know, call Ryan. But Ryan was like, well, my dog track hogs. I can't do anything for you. <laughs> I went to, I kid you not, I went to Google, and I typed in deer tracking dogs, and this list came up, and there was a guy right here in Asset, South Carolina, right down 601. Mm-hmm. I called him, and I told him what happened. He said, yeah, I got dogs. I said, oh, can you help me? He said, yeah. I said, how much do you charge? He said, I'll charge nothing. He said, I just like doing it. Wow. I said, okay. So this guy, he comes out, yeah, he comes out to a club. He shows up, and um, he said, okay, go down, show me where you think, you know, you hit him at. So now the whole time I'm waiting on here, I'm second guessing myself. Right. I'm like, did I hit it? Did I not hit it? Was it a bad shot? So then he comes out. He walks around. He says, I don't see the blood, man. He said, you sure? I said, man, I thought I hit it. I don't know. Maybe I did. Yeah, there are plenty of times where I thought I've hit a deer or hit mm-hmm. a turkey and I wasn't 100% sure. You know, you're sure at the time, but then once it takes you a little bit of time to start that recovery process, that's when the doubt creeps in. Yeah. So crazy. So my man gets his dog. He takes him over to the feeder. This dog beelines right in the direction where I thought the deer went. So he goes about 15, 20 yards in. He was like, I got blood. I'm like, what? I was literally about 10 yards off from where I thought the deer went. Mm-hmm. We're walking. We're walking. I'm behind him. 
we go maybe 30, 35 yards. He goes around these bushes. He was like, I found your deer. I probably walked past that deer five times, man, and didn't see him. Wow. And don't realize how I walked past that deer. Because I kept telling a lot of guys at the club, he said, let me tell you something, man. You ain't the first, and you ain't going to be the last one that happens. <laughs> he says, he's a hunter out here. I'm going to tell you that hasn't happened to them. Now, so just, well, your arrow, the pass through, did was it sticking in the ground? Did you like? Were you? Did you see your arrow after after it went through and everything? No, we we couldn't find it. Cause that's the first thing I did, and then that's the first thing he did when he came out. He said, "Well, where are you shooting from?" And I showed him, and we walked, we walked. He says, "Man, there's no telling where that arrow is, man. He said it could be in the dirt somewhere." Right. But the relief when we found it, and it was crazy because I knew I was looking for it, so I didn't I didn't tell my wife, I didn't send my daughter a message, nothing. <laughs> You wanted yeah. to make sure you had it first before you told anybody. I had to make sure, you know, because we were going out of town that day. And, and finally I told us, hey, I'm looking for a deer. I might be a little late. But it was like just a relief once we found it because she was killing me. Because she killed that deer last year. And I'm sitting here like, I'm going to go another year, not kill a deer. And I got to hear this. Oh, well, I killed a deer. You haven't killed one yet. I was like, <laughs> I'm tired of hearing that, man. You're killing me over here. <laughs> so now I finally got my deer. And I'm like, great. But the, the crazy thing about that, we go back out four days later. I'm taking my daughter hunting. My father-in-law's in town. I'm just getting them out. I'm happy. I got my deer. I'm good to go. Right. I'm in the blind, on the phone, playing games because I wasn't really trying to hunt. And all Pressure. of a sudden, what happens? I see another buck walk in. And I'm like, this cannot be happening. I've been trying three years. And you tell me I got a second buck in four days coming in front of me. Wow. Did your, Lord, sure did, did your daughter lay that one down? Uh, I'll leave that one down. <laughs> second boat killed in four days. Wow. And the crazy thing about this, when he came in, he was coming in. I just hit the bleat one time. He came right to the feeder. I knew I had all my fundamentals down this time. I knew what I was doing. I was still nervous, but I knew exactly what I needed to do. And I waited. And this, what I did this time is I stood in the blind. I stayed back. The first time, I kept peeking. I kept peeking. Right. I think that's what kind of got me. But this time I said, if he's coming in, he's going to come to that theater. I don't need to keep looking. So finally, I just kind of, I gave him a little bit, and I finally I kind of glanced forward a little bit. I saw him at the theater. Now, granted now, remember, this is 25 yards away. This is how right. close these deer were. So I sit there. He goes broadside. I pull back. I let the arrow go. And what he did, he went broadside, and he quartered away just a little. And it was like my eyes went, just like, crazy. When the arrow hit him, he took one step and went wow. down. And I'm, I'm sitting here looking like, is that right? This, I'm wait, I'm look, I'll wait for him to run. And he went down. And so I called my wife and told her. She was like, what? I said, I kid you not. I'm looking at him right here. I got a second one. And she's like, you got to be kidding me. I said, no. So the second call was to one of my guys I talked with, a uh, guy named Marty. He's uh, Buck ATR on uh, Instagram. Mm-hmm. And I told him what happened. He said, the deer didn't run. I said, no. He's like, I need a picture of that. <laughs> so I took a picture. I sent it to him. He was like, Antonio, he said, that is like a one in a million shot for somebody bow hunting. Yeah. The deer dropped like that. He said, when I saw the color of the blood, he said, you ever heard of oxygenated blood? He said, that deer was fighting a losing battle from the time that arrow hit him. And he just dropped. He went straight down. Best recovery I've ever had in, well, like I've been hunting 20 years, but <laughs> you couldn't ask for a better setup, man. Look, when you don't have, when the tracking job is short, man, that's the best, that's the best ones. We you take that any day of the week. And the other thing, too, that's why I love bow hunting. Like, I don't rifle hunt at all. I use my shotgun when I go duck hunting and uh, goose hunting, and I may take it this year a little bit for turkey hunting just to um, just kind of like a, as a uh, insurance policy. But okay. everything I've done, I've done with a bow. Hogs, I killed a turkey last year with my bow. Of course, deer. I mean, I, that's why I love bow hunting because they get them in that 15 to 25 yard space mm-hmm. and have them that close and have them up on you. Man, there's nothing like it. Yeah, that was that was like the most amazing thing because I've never seen a doe, I mean, excuse me, a deer that close, not hunting, not hunting wise. That was just new for me. I had been in the stand and seen them, you know, off, you know, 100, you know, 125 yards, but not 25, 20, 25 yards, not right in front of me. Right. And that made me respect hunting a lot more. 
you know, saying, hey, your set control was good that day, your win was good, you know, you were in the right place, right time, you got a great shot. It was like everything I've been reading, writing, learning, listening to, it's like it all came into play at one time. And see, that's the other thing, too, why I like hunting in a blind. You can get away with a lot more in a blind than you can if you're in a climber or in a, in a tree stand or whatever. You know, in a blind, you sit further back. You know, you put you can still have your camo pants on, but you put on, you know, like a black shirt or a black hoodie and you just kind of blend in into the background. That's, that's why I love hunting in a blind because you can it's easier to get into one. Your sight is a little bit prohibited, just a little yeah. bit. Obviously, you can't see as good as you would, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet in the air. But, man, just being sitting right there on the ground out of eye level with them uh, with them deer or them hogs or, the, or them turkeys man, that. That's one. That's what I really like. Yeah, man. Hey, I'm good. The, the freezer's full. What the guy say? Feeding the family. Hey, I think I checked every box this year. Yeah, no, you you did good. Now, what's what's the next thing? I saw you bought some. Uh, you bought a camera, a uh, GoPro. Uh, you gonna do some self filming? Are you thinking about doing some self filming? Okay, let me tell you about this GoPro. All right, <laughs> I got that Go, <laughs> GoPro for I think Father's Day and my. My wife had been telling me for the longest, take your GoPro, take your GoPro. And I was like, yeah, I get to it, I get to it. So I'm sitting here this whole season, I was like, if I had that GoPro, when I got these last two deer, I would have footage of it. So this GoPro has just been sitting in my closet, I don't know how long, and I just haven't been using it. But I'm going to put it into play this year, I promise you. You guys are going to see some good footage out there come this year. Keep my fingers crossed, hopefully. Yeah, I love mine. I think I'm on probably gopro number three because i've destroyed at least two of them uh just doing crazy things whether it's like putting them on the ground for you know recording stuff for atv i tried to get a time lapse on i-20 one time and it snatched it off the truck <laughs> so <laughs> i i abuse gopros but they they get great footage i use them a lot for like secondary angles angles and stuff they're really good with time lapse especially when i'm out there goose hunting or duck hunting or whatnot so i i love the gopro are you gonna use any other cameras like any other bigger size canon cameras or anything like that um and start recording uh more no i haven't uh like i said the gopro like i said i'm, I'm still fresh at all this man i did buy a mount for the gopro to put outside the blind in the stand yep. so i'm taking baby steps i'm getting small it, it'll get a little bigger get the remote you know and branch get the out. remote too yeah so you know we're, like i said we're getting there man I, I tell people, you know, I got a young man who came out, you know, he worked on my HVAC this year, and he says, I know nothing about hunting, but I want to get into it. And so he asked me, he said, what do I need to get? And I said, man, I said, you got to get a whole lot of stuff. This is this more than just getting some clothes and going out. And I said, but look, let me let me remind you, I said, me, my wife, my daughter, we're just starting. You know, we're new at this. I'm not an expert. You know, I can only right. tell you what I'm doing and, you know, what other guys are doing and what guys are telling me. So he kind of looked at me. He said, oh. He said, this really don't like, I said, this really on my second, we've been three years, but really our second year of, of true hunting. And he's like, well, he said, I understand what you're saying. He said, but I'm looking at all these pictures you're sending me of hogs and deer and meat. He said, you guys have killed in two year period, six hogs and three deer. And you tell me, y'all know what you're doing. He says, well, I just want you to show me what you're not doing so I can do the same thing. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. He's more exactly it, right. Yeah, I said, more I thought about it, I said, man, he is right, you know, because we've given away a lot of meat. And, you know, even my wife, you know, she started to support me. You know, as we started bringing more and more meat home, and she was like, hey, you do what you got to do. She's like, now, if we can go and say get a hog or get a deer, and we can go help 10, 15 families, whether it's just giving a pack of sausage, you know, a pack of steaks, she said, I'm all for that. I don't have a problem with it. Right. She said, because... You know, helping other people is, is what is, is what it's about. And I, I firmly be, believe, and you know, I, I tell a lot of guys, I said, just my, I, I believe in a lot of karma. And if I go out here, you know, say if I kill five deer in a year, and I don't take and share that meat with anybody else, be careful what you ask for, because the next time you go back out, you know, you might not kill anything because you're being selfish. Right. Firmly believe you got to share right. it. Right. 
No, I totally, I totally agree with that too. I try to make sure, you know, I share, you know, I get, and now it's gotten to the point, you know, I think I'm about four years in now. It gets to the point where I get people calling me or sending me text messages, or whatever. You kill a deer yet? <laughs> kill a hog yet? You got, you got any deer meat left? You got any sausage left? Like people, like all of a sudden, I become, I become the plug for all the wild game meat and stuff, and people start hitting me up. But no, that's definitely part of it, and it, it. it really really is a part um that i enjoy now as far as with hunting with the marshes and stuff like on instagram and whatnot are you branding that like are you going to do are you guys doing any kind of like non-profit stuff are you thinking about jumping full in into the uh into the hunting industry and doing media and stuff like that what what's what what's the game plan you know we i'm gonna tell you it's, it's funny you say that it, it has crossed our mind. Uh, the Instagram page, a friend of mine, he told me, he said, hey, you should do an Instagram page, man, and put it out there you know, so your, your friends, family can see it. And it said, you know, you never know who's going to be looking at this. He said, because let's, let's be honest, man, he said, you're not the normal hunting family. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I, I see what he, what he means because people look at, my, look at our page and they see my daughter on there, they see my wife on there. They're like, your wife killed that? And I was like, yeah. And I got guys all the time. I said, man, I said, you know, don't take the wrong way. He said, I've never seen, you know, an African American woman hunt. <laughs> he said, that's, right. that's new. And he said, he said, I mean, like I say, that's good because hunting has got a misconception that it's only a certain diverse group of people who do it. And it's a very small diverse group, but that diversity needs to get bigger. Right. And we have looked at, you know, possibly, you know, getting ourselves a nice little logo or something. And, you know, when I go out, I even talk to a lot of young males about it, uh, females, Caucasian, African American, you name it. They're just trying to get honey out there. And, you know, a lot of it I really pressed, you know, started looking at it. I don't know if you familiar with like uh, the Hunter Nation. Yep. They, they came out a while ago and they happened to see us out there and was like, hey, you know, we kind of, we want to do a profile on you guys, you know, and they, they put us on their page and a lot of people saw it. And it's, it's like, man, a lot of people, you know, started following us. You know, we started this with just the idea of family to see it. You know, and you figure we had four, five, six followers. Now we're close to almost a thousand. You know, which is small, but that's more than what I would ever would imagine would follow our page. Right, right. No, it. I mean, and the thing is, is like you said the more you put it out there the more you know that people see that you guys are out there the more people are going to follow you and stuff hopefully you know after they check out this podcast uh with you guys you know that'll bring some more attention and draw you know more eyeballs to it Uh, i mean me personally if you ask me my opinion which you didn't um i think that you should definitely keep rolling with it man any kind of like media stuff Mm -hmm. that you want to put out there and keep you know putting out your videos your trail cam pictures and stuff because i mean i enjoy it like i was was going through your page when i was doing my research and i was just like man they got some good stuff y'all got some good stuff out there yeah and and we're trying to keep it interesting you know every once in a while you know i try to branch away you know from the honey but like hey we're still a regular normal family we dress up we go to events you know, I, I put my ladies on there, you know, but when it's time to get out there and, and get dirty and get in the woods, they're right out there with me, you know. And then at the end of the day, guess what? They go back to getting their nails done and, and hair and doing the girly, girly thing and, you know, just keeping it, like I said, they keep it 100 and keep it real, man. Yeah. No, there's there's definitely nothing wrong with that. Now, before I get you out of here, let me. I want to ask you about your turkey season uh, coming up here. Uh, have you done a lot of scouting? I saw, I think, one thing where you're like getting your feeders and everything straight, but the corn and whatnot. But have you have you gotten any good pictures? Have you seen uh, any good uh, prospects for turkey season coming up? Man, you know what's crazy? As my wife said the same thing. We had turkeys in there. I'm talking three times a day, man. My trailer account, I would be at work, the pictures would just be popping up, popping up. I'm like, okay, this is good activity. In the last two weeks, I don't know if these guys have went on vacation or they gone somewhere. <laughs> I don't know what's popping up. I haven't seen a turkey in almost two weeks now, man. No, it, it gets like that. It, it definitely like it booms and then it it dies down and then the next thing you know they they circle back around turkey season start is it this weekend uh March coming up like 20th, a, i think it is okay okay 
Okay, so you still got still got another week or so. Yeah, man, just, you know, like we were saying earlier, just get, even if you don't see it on the camera, the one thing I've learned is trail cameras don't tell you everything that's going on out there. You know, they're, now, sometimes I feel like the animals know where the cameras are and they start avoiding the cameras. Mm-hmm. So you just, like we were saying earlier, just got to get out there and put in your, put in your woods time. Yeah, it, you know what? And, and one thing I, I try to remember to keep in mind, you know, if there'll be days where I would go out, I wouldn't see anything. I would do something stupid, leave my thermos cell at home, you know, just making crazy mistakes. And what I, what I had to tell myself, I was like, you know what? There's no such thing as a bad day of hunting, man, because whatever you did wrong that day or whatever you think you could have did better, you just improve on it for the next hunt, man. No, that's that's true. That's true. That's a that's a very good attitude to have, and it keeps you, you know, going back out there again and again. Yeah, and I, I tell you this all, the Instagram, it's, it's, it's been a good thing, man, because I've, I've met some good guys on here who have, who have genuinely, you know, I see their page, I ask a question, and they would immediately, you know, they'll come back and be like, hey, hold on, man, let, let me tell you, this is what you do, or next time, try this. And it was just like, just, we just connected with quite a few guys, man. And it was like, he's one guy, uh, what's his name, uh, Evan, Evan Smith, he's like, he's out of Indiana, me and him go back and forth. He's a veteran. We've talked about stuff. My man Marty, uh, the Ignaziac, he came down for a trade show. Him and I hung out and we talked hunting stuff. Um, another guy, uh, Greg, I think it's Greg, Greg Bainey, Greg Bainey, I'm not sure. But uh, he, mm-hmm. he always comes back. When I ask a question, he'll tell me. Like, he's the one uh, we were talking one day because a lot of guys tell me, don't use the bathroom around your stand. And I asked him about that one day. And he was like, Antonio, that's crap. Yep. He said, because think about it. A buck doesn't want that smell in the area. He doesn't know the difference whether it's a male buck or a male. He said, I've done scrapes and went and used the bathroom right in it. Yep. And got trail camera activity. Well, guess what? The next day, I got bucks all in there. Yep. So what is that? (laughs) It's so funny because that was one of the things – on episode two with uh ken brown we and him were talking and we were going back and forth and talking about like mock scrapes and stuff like that and he was like just pee he's like just pee just pee out the stand he's like i do it all the time it's like real he's like yeah just if you see a scrape he's like don't waste your time or waste your money on all these drippings and mock <laughs> scrape drippings and all that stuff he said if you see a scrape just go pee in it and see what happens so we me and the kids we went out there and sure enough i was walking by and i was like that's a scrape and you know i kind of started looking over it looking over it and just being careful you know i didn't want to get you know all my scent Mm -hmm. to send it up in the area or whatnot but i went back i moved the camera from somewhere else over the scrape and i peed right in that scrape and literally probably 10 hours later the next day we went out there and probably 10 hours later from the time i peed in the scrape and hung the camera there was a buck that was there and he was pissed <laughs> like he was just chewing all on the daggum leaves like the licking branch and stuff he was going in on it the scrape got bigger <laughs> all right so i'm a firm believer of that tactic and it's funny like i said i just found out about that last year too and mm-hmm. that that's like my go-to now like i'm just like scrapping up you know holes and just peeing in them everywhere it's like all right who's gonna take like who who is this gonna piss off <laughs> yeah man i get that first deer i got i think i literally had just went outside the blind like 30 minutes before that deer showed up i was like so i'm just drinking all kind of water i'm trying to get as many deer in the area as i can <laughs> Oh, <laughs> man. Antonio, I sure appreciate you taking the time, man. I'm going to go ahead and get ready to get out of here. Let the people know where they can find the marshes. Okay, you can find us where, uh, on Instagram. We're at hunting with the marshes. You click on it, uh, you'll see a nice picture of us, you know, with our camel on, looking fierce, trying to represent for everybody out there who's trying to get into the hunting game. So, uh, hey, check us out, hunt with the marshes. Check out our page. And you follow us, and we follow back. That's the way they, I firmly believe. Man, that's what's up. Hey, thanks for coming on. Um, let's catch up again after turkey season died down a little bit and see uh, see how you did. Okay. Yeah, maybe we get uh, Mrs. Marsh on here, too, and she can maybe get her perspective from the female side and <laughs> share her knowledge.
Miss Kimberly Marsh, wife of Antonio Marsh, part two of my interview slash conversation with the Marshes, hunting with the Marshes. Kimberly, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing good. So we just wrapped up a session, me and Antonio, but I wanted to bring you on because I wanted to know your perspective, your experiences, and just kind of how you got into this whole uh, hunting game. He said that once he started, you kind of joined in. Was it one of those things where you saw him doing it and was like, hey, I want to do it too? Or is it is it in your blood? Did you grow up with it in your family? Like what, what made you want to join your husband? Well, I didn't grow up with it in my family because I never hunted in my life, but um, never seen myself hunting as well. I always said, hey, I'm not going to hunt because he started with my supervisor. And my supervisor was saying, come on out, go hunting with us. And I'm like, mm, no, I don't think that's for me. But then I saw him doing it. So I was like, well, he's like, he's having fun. So I was like, well, I'll go out and do it. And we first started as just shooting our bows because he went out and bought me a bow. So we went to the range, archery range on Fort Jackson, so that's how we both started. And then eventually I got went out to Camden with him, and he bought me a purple bow, um, bear bow. So, yeah, that's how I first started. And then sitting out in Camden with him. Nice. For a while. Now, yeah. the purple bow, did you want it to be purple, or was... Yes, I'm a girl. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you phrased that. You're like, yes, I'm a girl. Duh. Okay. I got you. I got you. So now you got your bow and you got out there and you started shooting it. Did you immediately like it? Did you take to it pretty quickly? Uh, I think so. Yeah. When we first went to go buy the, um, the cruiser at, uh, what was that? Um, Cabela's. Yep. Yeah. The guys were laughing at me because I was, um, practicing in my, uh, wedges. So <laughs> yeah, it was like, are you really going to do this? Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to do it. And I did pretty good. Okay. Okay, yeah, going out in the wedges, that's a whole nother conversation <laughs> for another day. Anybody that knows me knows I absolutely despise wedge heels, but I'm not going to go in on that right now. That's a whole different conversation. Um, the funny thing, though, the the Bear Cruiser was my first bow as well. They, It's funny that they make those bows as an entry-level bow for kids, and they can grow with them all the way up to adulthood. So my first uh, my first kill was with a bear cruiser. It was a it was a hog down in South Georgia, and I also uh, killed a doe with my bear cruiser. So it, those are really good bows, especially to get started off in and uh, and just to get acclimated. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, I'm looking to hopefully ne- um, this season coming up um, deer season. I'm hopefully I'm gonna try to use mine since Antonio got one this past season. He got two. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, we're a now, very you- competitive family, so. Uh, I could tell because he was he was very distinct in saying that he didn't really you know he was feeling the pressure from uh, from killing you know or not killing the deer and you pretty much killed the deer the first time you went out. Yeah, so he couldn't kill the deer with a rifle. He had to go out and get it with his bow. Now yours was that with a bow or was it a, with a rifle that first one? My first one was with a rifle. Wow. Wow. Now, would you say that is your mem- most memorable hunt, or do you have, like, anything that sticks out or another hunt that sticks out uh, besides that one? Well, that is my first one, so I would say that that is probably my most memorable hunt. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now. It was a crazy night, too. Yeah, yeah. Now, what? so I know he told me, you know, from his perspective, how, how, what about you? How, how do you remember that night? Um, I remember that night we was getting ready to pack up and I saw from looking to the right, saw this deer creeping through the ditch. And I was like, wow, he's blending in really good with the brush. So I was like, wow, that's a buck. And I was like, hey, look. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, my goodness. So yeah, everything goes out the window with, when you're hunting uh, your first your first one. Right. So I didn't really, I was like, oh, God, what do I do? I was like, okay, let me let me go through the uh, rifle. Let me look through my scope. Let me sight. Couldn't see anything, so I was like, okay, it's not going to work. So I was like, okay, he's, he's going to circle back around. So I just kept my eye on my sight and through the scope. And then, sure enough, he came back through the, from the left, going going through the, um, to the feeder. And I think Antonio was more excited than I was. He was like, take the shot, take the <laughs> shot. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I'm like, I got it. Let me let me breathe right. Let me get it down. I know how to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I think we were sitting, 
it was like we were arguing, but we weren't saying anything. Right. So, you know, they're fussing, but yeah. So, I mean, it was a perfect shot, though. I mean, he just stood there and posed for me and, hey. And ask for a better shot. Yeah, no, especially when they when it sets up like that on the first time. I was telling him, I think that there's definitely a lot of beginner's luck the first time around because the first few times I went out, you know, whether it was deer hunting, hog hunting, or uh, when I went duck hunting the first time, there's always like there's that first time beginner's luck, and it kind of gets you, you know, it kind of gasses you up to think like, hey, this is how it's going to be. Is it going to be like this every time? And then once you get into it, you find out, eh, that's not quite how it works yeah well we was out hog hunting so hey I, i'll take the um the deer over the hog let me backtrack so with the rifle you know you i heard you say you was like i know how to shoot were you guys in the military together were you are you were in the military or a veteran yes we both were in the military together oh okay 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 is that how you guys met and things progressed yes we both met in the military at fort Knox. okay okay nice nice yeah so it definitely i've found in my in my limited time you know hunting myself because like i was telling him i've only been hunting about four years myself but you know you military folks are definitely more successful it seems like because you guys come in already with a learning curve with the firearms and the and being able to shoot and being snipers and stuff like that you guys come in almost (laughs) like a step ahead yeah well they trained us pretty good so yeah (laughs) Now, what are you? What is your favorite part of the process? Like, are you very hands-on out there? You know, with the blinds and doing work at the club and stuff like that? Or are you just kind of like to stroll in after the fact? Or what? How how do you uh, how do you like to handle the process? Um, I like to stroll stroll in after the fact. Um. <laughs> I go in sometimes, you know. I, I appreciate Speak the fact stuff. that you are honest that you are honest with that in the beginning though. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I mean I go out with him and when he goes and fills up the feeder, you know, and go and get the corn, you know, I don't mind doing that part, but as far as all of the extra labor Yeah. Yeah, hey, I work hard on Monday through Friday. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just this is a weekend thing for you, huh? No, it's not a weekend thing. I look at it as a stress reliever as well. Right, right. Because it is relaxing once you go out. And I mean, and also to hunt and and just the quality time that we spend. I know it's quiet time, but it's also quality time. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, is there any friendly competition between you and your daughter? Oh, (laughs) yeah. It's, I told you it's a rivalry between all of us. It's not just me and my daughter. Oh. She has to get here now, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, it, it's fun to have that that little back and forth, and to, and just to kind of be able to uh, push each other back and forth. So, but let me ask you this, okay? This is between me and you, just just me and you talking. Who's the better shooter? Out of out of all of y'all, who? out of everybody, who's? Oh, my husband, hands down. What? You don't have to say that if he's because he's close by now. This this between just me and you. I'm not. He, he is. He's a perfectionist. He goes out there. I mean, he's at the range, archery range. He takes his lunch breaks and goes to archery range. Oh, that's a man after my own heart right there. I, I, I would. Yeah. I, and I keep saying that I'm going to do it, but I haven't done it yet. So. Now, that's with the bow. Now, with the with a rifle, you, would you say he's better, too, or, or, or you got him on that? He's probably better, okay. yeah. Okay. Wow. Wow. That's, that's not the answer I was expecting, but okay. I, I respect that. I mean, it's not. Yeah, I'm on. <laughs> All right, last question, and I'll get you out of here. So you've taken down a hog and one buck, two bucks? We've taken down um, six hog and three deer, but i only taken down one deer. Okay. All right. What Do you have, like, a bucket list or, like, any kind of goals for this year? Like, do you have, like, a bucket list hunt or, like, goals for your uh, hunting season coming up? I, I do. I want to um, at least get one with the bow, and I do want to get a hog. Okay. Okay. Are you going to go out there and hit up the turkeys, too? I do want to try it. Yeah, we've been seeing them around our flock, so yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, no, the turkey, I'm telling you from my experience, turkey hunting is definitely, it's one of those things that's addictive, especially if you do it with a bow. I got my first turkey with a bow last year, and I am geeked up to get back out there and try again this uh, this season coming up. 
Well, that sounds like I need to um, take my bow and put it in my trunk then and go to the range tomorrow, huh? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it takes a little bit of work, but getting a turkey with a bow, man, it, you'd be surprised how many people look at me in a different light when I tell them, it's like, oh, you shot a turkey with a bow? I'm just like, yeah. Hey. Yeah, I practice. It worked, like you know. But it, it's definitely, it's definitely what I what I tell people. It's definitely the thing that I am most proud of so far in my uh, in my four year hunting career. Oh yeah, I, I understand because I'm proud of my buck that I got and I have it hanging up in my office. And most of my um the guys that come in, they come and look and they was like, "Did you shoot that?" And I was like, "Wow, yeah, it's, on, it's on my wall, right?" And they was like, "Wow." <laughs> <laughs> And just last week, I got this call. It's like, hey, I heard something about you, and I can't believe it. And I'm like, what did you hear? And he was like, somebody told me that you hunt. And I'm like, yeah, that was true. That was about me. And it was like, wow, I would have never guessed it. And it's amazing that all of these are coming from um, white males. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny because, like I was telling Antonio, like you go through that little, that period at least for me, you go through that period where it's like, you know, people start seeing your pictures or they start seeing, you know, your taxidermy returns and stuff like that. And they're just like, wow, did you kill that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, wow, you hunt? Yeah. And then like that, you know, that that surprise and that, you know, that big eyed factor to me is just always funny. And then after a while, you know, the barriers kind of come down and they're just like, wow, you can. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can do that. I sure can. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, so now that's the conversation. Whenever they come over, they be like, "Hey, yeah," they come in there, and they just sit down, and we just have this conversation now. So it's like, yeah, you can you can wear heels, and you can also, you know, after work, you can go in the woods and you know relax and let your hair down. Right. Yep. And have a good time. Yeah, wow. I think it's a stigma that's been associated with it for for so long. Do you have like any of your girlfriends or any sisters or anything that you're going to try to introduce or try to get to come out with y'all? Um, I don't have any sisters. However, um, one of the girls from the gym, she said that she would like to try it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's so. good. Yeah, any Anytime you can introduce someone new to our sport, that's definitely a win-win, a good thing. Yeah, but we're about safety first. So, yeah. <laughs> so, we got to, so we got to see what you're working with first. <laughs> You gotta put you gotta put them through some put them through some tests put them through the paces yeah, to make sure I that. I think some people realize that you know you gotta be safe out there in those woods, and I think a lot of people think that it's just easy, and it's it's not just that easy. Right? No, you definitely you gotta you gotta do your homework and yes, yeah, safety first, and make sure you understand what's going on out there. Even you know with a bow, there's a series of steps that you gotta follow, and just make sure you're safe. And God knows, most definitely, anytime you got a firearm, I mean that's a whole nother level of safety there exactly not for just them but for the other people that are out there as well hunting so you know right exactly well kimberly i appreciate you taking the time thank you for coming on this is going to be uh i'm very excited about these two conversations um and i can't wait to uh to put them out there just where can we find the marshes and hunting with the marshes um you can find us on instagram at hashtag hunting with the marshes Nice. Kimberly, thank you so much. I look forward to having you guys back on after turkey season, all right? Yes, look forward to having us again. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now, I certainly appreciate Antonio and Kimberly Marsh coming through on the Bryantland Country Podcast. Man, they have had one hell of a run the last couple of years, being very successful down in South Carolina with their hogs and the deer. Pretty sure they'll probably knock out a turkey or two in the upcoming turkey season. But I just think them for coming on the podcast and y'all make sure y'all go follow the links inside the um inside the info section of these podcasts man and make sure you're following them on instagram and checking out their stuff and whatever they got going on uh before i get ready to get out of here i want to just throw out a couple of plugs make sure you're going to the bryantlandcountry.com website bryantlandcountry.com clicking on that on demand tab and looking at some of our videos man we got a great catalog of videos we got some youtube uh videos as well you can go check out bryantland on youtube put together a pretty good catalog of videos on different things different subjects different interviews um so go check out our content on bryantlandcountry.com like i said on that on demand tab we still got some pretty good merch out there hats t-shirts 
uh, Bryantland merch. Make sure you're going same place, BryantlandCountry.com. Hit that shop tab and get you some uh, Bryantland merch, man. We sure appreciate it. Thank you, as always, for all the support. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, I mean, the next coming episodes, I got some uh, feedback that I'm going to read to you guys, but I'm going to go ahead and get ready to get out of here. Make sure you guys come back and join me on another episode of the Bryantland Country Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Bryant Land Country Podcast, hosted by AB3. Please leave us a positive review and five-star rating on iTunes. Be sure to check out our podcast section on our website, bryantlandcountry.com, for previous podcasts. Check us out on Instagram at Official Bryant Land and Twitter at 3 Bryant Land. This has been an AB3 Media Production. Join us next time for another edition of the Bryant Land Country Podcast. <laughs>